Hey guys, so before we jump into the next session, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you have not RSVP'd to the hackathon on the Devfolio platform, you have to do that. In order to submit a project and be eligible for prizes, you need to RSVP. So make sure that you and all your teammates go into Devfolio and you RSVP. And after doing that, you go to the Slack channel and you check in by posting a message on the check-in channel. Uh, you need to do this. If your teammates haven't done this, please do that. Also, if you don't have a team or you need a teammate, please reach out to me. I'm available on Slack. Um, also, you know, if you just have an idea that you'd like to run by me, please do that because we'd like to check in on all of you, make sure you have everything you need to, to build the best possible project. So if you have any blockers or even if you don't, even if things are going well and you're excited and you just want to share what you're working on, please do that. Uh, obviously, we'll keep it confidential, but we just want to make sure that everybody is on track to actually build something because that's what this is all about. It's about learning and building. And learning by building. So please do reach out. Okay, housekeeping out of the way. Very excited to introduce our next speaker, uh, Anand Dutta. So Anand will you know, introduce himself shortly, but thank you for being here, Anand. A quick intro, Anand is a vice president at Nexus Venture Partners, one of the top VC funds in the country. You guys must be aware that recently they've been in the news because their portfolio company, Postman, who we all love, uh, was recently valued at more than $2 billion. And several of the other portfolio investments have also been raising money, like Zolo stays very recently. Uh, so Anand, prior to being at Nexus, he was uh, the India CEO and then head of new markets for Bima, which is an insurtech giant. So that's where he derives his insurance knowledge and expertise from. And he'll be talking to us today about insurance opportunities using the account aggregator. So thank you so much for being here, Anand. Over to you. Thanks, Aryaman. Thanks. And uh, as I was telling Aryaman back, I think Anand's back. Anand, are you there? See the screen. I have just started screen sharing. Yeah, now it's popped up. So that's that's the idea. What I'll try to cover today is a bit around insurance. What insurance exactly is? Uh, because many of us, uh, we understand insurance only as a consumer of product. Uh, look at a bit of what are the innovations which are happening across the geography globally. What are the things which are happening? What are the things which are uh, uh, more uh, in the vogue, so to say? And uh, then try to jump right into what's happening within India with account aggregator and with the support of IRDA. Uh, how? Uh, uh, how uh, that's going to change uh, the insurtech landscape in India. Yeah. So let me first start with a brief introduction for myself. Yeah. And generally, I would go with an introduction which is very morose and you know just talk about uh, hey, I am a nexus, I do investing and all. But I thought that why not connect this more with the topic for today, which is around insurance, because many of you will be at different life stages and as you can see insurance as a product touches at us at, at several different junctures and impacts us differently and, and when i talk about through this presentation i want you to relate to that insurance as a product and think of a consumer persona because that generally is the way how you build good startups you have to put yourself or get a consumer persona in mind think about his challenges and then try to solve for those challenges. So that's that's more about me, a uh, grad from IIT Kharagpur. I'm Ahmedabad. That was, those were the young days. Not much diversity in the colleges, as you can see from the pic. Life was still fun. No insurance whatsoever. No risk. Nothing. Uh, that's what I used to think. Risk was always there. We used to drive a lot of bikes. But <laughs> that's it. Then we moved to. I did some strategy consulting with Bain. Worked with another fintech uh, financial services company, Franklin Templeton. Many of you might know it from investment. Uh, was a founding team member of a startup, Magic Pin. Did a startup, failed. Uh, came back, joined Bima, which Ariman was talking about. It's an insure tech venture, which take insurance to the masses. Like insurance, the way we consume is not something which the really the large masses can consume. But as you can see, during this phase, my life phase changed. I got married. As you can understand, like we traveled a lot, a lot of adventures, what you can see from the pic. And what became important for us was to take a health cover and a travel cover. We were still not taking a life cover, by the way. We should have taken. And then that's what you will realize when you are in that 20 to 30 years of uh, age, age bracket. Uh, you think 
what is going to happen to us like nothing can change us and, and we don't take that insurance but then uh, recently last uh, a year back i moved into nexus a fun fact uh, the day i had my first interview with nexus that was the day my son was born and i became a complete family man then and and guess what the first thing i did took a life insurance uh, because now the number of dependent on me increase so i would love for you guys to hold this in mind as a consumer persona as the journey three or four different stages in your life what you go through and how the risks in your life changes or what goes on in consumer's mind and how then actually the different type of insurances becomes important and we'll come back to this my introduction yeah now starting with uh, some anecdotes on how this trillion dollar industry started it actually all started from a small coffee shop called lloyds in england fun fact is that lloyds still stays and it's a very large insurance company uh, what lloyds used to happen in that coffee store was that a lot of this uh, sailors will come there they will be all this pirates and the uh, captain jack and captain john and whatever you see in pirates of caribbean before they go before the sailors will go into the voyage they will be super scared of them and they will say that hey if i lose my uh, sail if i lose my trade i need to have some insurance for this and the word underwriting which you will hear so much in insurance that actually comes from there as well the financiers who will be sitting in the coffee shop the sailors will go to them and the financier will see what sort of risk he is ready to take and he will write below that and that will be called underwriting the entire thing that got formalized in what was called as a scottish widow fund and scottish widow fund was uh, formed at the time of Napole uh, napoleonic wars where france and england was fighting and a lot of people died and there were a lot of widows over there and and there was nothing to support them so one of the clergy mans the man's name was uh, i think reverend james grant he started putting probability and statistics behind this that's where the data sciences started coming into insurance and that's how this actually became a, a what you understand about modern insurance he created guess what like right now we take a lot of this data to be uh, uh, so easy to come at that time there was no life expect expectancy data, data. there were no nobody was tracking how long who will live what sort of thing will impact the death rate and if somebody dies what amount of money will be good for them to and because let's say if you are saying i am going to give you an insurance how much money do you need the how long are you going to live after your the person you are dependent on that he also dies so all this sort of numbering that's what this reverend did and pretty much this clergyman set up this new uh, first insurance company in the world so to say scottish widow fund another fun fact in 1999 lloyds bought scottish widow fund so both of them now exist as one insurance company so there's a bit of a history going on over there and and this also tells you how insurance companies how old they are we are talking about uh, this one is in 17th century 1652 or something it's when 1650s is when uh, the napoleonic wars were really happening and 1999 is when scottish widow fund got bought by lloyds then finally another event which uh, impacted a lot of this uh, insurance companies getting uh, you know moving into the current form was the london fire of 1834 uh, just just to mark this is not the main london fire which you talk about which was much earlier i think around 1600s or something uh, this is where what started happening was this guys uh, property and casualty insurance actually came into play and people realized that apart from life being lost even if you lose your property and if you lose other risk there are other risk in your life which can really really impact you and and you can go broke and that's where the all actually the fun another fun fact is the fire brigade and the system that uh, comes around the fire brigade that literally started from this where insurance companies would uh, uh, set up their own fire brigades and if you watch movies like gangs of new york and other things you will see that what happens is uh, you will see that there is a fire and that's where the adverse selection around the claims management and will touch upon that as well that happened when uh, fire brigades will run across and move across houses which are on fire because these guy these houses were not under their insurance policy and they will move to a house which is maybe less impacted but still under their policy and they'll try to save it all these houses will be have metal plate think about it one house has a axa metal plate one house has a this metal plate and this also went towards the claims management and the other aspects so if you look at uh, 
right now if you look at new york or us every had a, has had a house as a burglar alarm every house has a security system which most of the time are sponsored by you know the insurance company because the, that that reduces their premium so that's that's bit of a history more of fun facts but going now moving into what insurance is and i have tried to keep it as simple as possible insurance essentially is a five step process you underwrite a risk so this is completely doing a probability statistics so let's say if you have a life expectancy chart which what who or the census of india census of india gives every year so you know that if you take a particular demography if you take men of the age of 35 to 40 years who are living in a particular salary range in a particular area under particular occupation this is the probability of that person incurring some sort of an event that could be life death accident whatever you are underwriting and this is a particular this is a case that we asked so you already see that while i am explaining in the simplest term i already touched upon 4 5 6 data points and richer this data points better is your underwriting capability so the first and foremost step itself is creating the probability and the statistics and the risk engine to understand the person on whom you are going to underwrite or the person on whom you are going to take risk what is the nature of that that risk that you are taking once you underwrite risk you acquire customer you will go and say that hey i am ready to take this risk that's where you will have the insurance agent come to you you will see the insurance ads all the targeting that happens and once you have acquired a certain customer then you make a pool of capital here also that prediction is very important because let's say if you are underwriting a risk of 2 lakh rupees and you have in this writing the underwriting risk of 2 lakh rupees you would have assumed how many customers need to be on the pool for you to be able to write that 2 lakh rupees risk right because at a very simple math level let's say you if you have a 100 customer they give everybody to everybody gives 2000 rupees then you have 2 lakh rupees of pool and then you know that you have underwritten a risk of 2 lakh so you are at least not at loss i hope i'm making sense and i'm happy to explain it in more detail uh, if needed but essentially you make a pool of capital and what you do is have this pool of capital and then start it start investing many people don't realize actually the insurance companies don't make profit out of underwriting risk if you look at any of the balance sheet of the insurance company 95% of their profit comes from investment because what happens is that the risk is staggered if i am taking the premium right now i am not going to die tomorrow i am probably going to die hopefully so in next 20 30 years later so there is a, that that sort of a life expectancy that i have but in that time i am still keeping and parking the money with the insurance company what they will do is that take this money and for the simplest assumption let's put it at investment in a uh, fixed deposit and then they will be generating 10% on this or whatever they are, sort of investment they do money uh, from this investment and that's the major profit they uh, they get out of it that's called float and if you read warren buffet or berkshire or his notes that's where he thinks insurance is probably the best business to be in because the amount of float the amount of investment pooled capital these guys have it's almost uh, if i am not wrong last time what i saw was the uh, five trillion or 5 to 10 trillion dollars that's the sort of thing so for example when i was working in franklin templeton the aum that they had was 1 trillion dollar and if you do nothing and make 1% out of it you are making 10 billion dollar of revenue every year put it in perspective to any of the companies in consumer that you talk about put it in qual perspective to any of the companies even in financial services you keep uh, uh think about just putting that money into investment right investment you you make that sort of money and finally what the insurance company do is manage claims and claims are the moment of truth in the life of an insurance company because if something happens to me on healthcare i go to the insurance company and they do not honor the claim then trust on insurance as a product goes down that is one of the reason why insurance is such a heavily regulated company i was again talking to arimon on backstage if you divide the financial products into three four products like lending is one saving is one insurance is one on most of the other products for example lending me as a company i am giving the money to the customer 
and the customer is supposed to give the money back to me. Whereas the insurance in savings also what happens is that you the customer gives money to the uh, uh, to the organization. So the role reverses, but there is a promise that the money will definitely, definitely come back. But in insurance, this is to the next level where the customer is giving money to the insurance company. And I'm saying, hey, in return, I'm just giving you a piece of paper that I promise tomorrow if something happens, I'm going to help you. And if I don't honor that, that promise which I've made, then this entire insurance industry will go down. And that's why insurance is such a highly regulated company, uh, industry. There is a regulator in India, it's called IRDI. Uh, insurance regulatory, uh, I'm forgetting the full name, uh, Authority of India. Uh, so it, in a nutshell, we can just cover the entire insurance landscape into this five uh, different uh, steps. Now, of course, why is insurance so interesting? So as I talked about earlier, it's just, if you look at it, it's probably one of the largest businesses across the world. It's a five trillion market worldwide. US alone is probably two trillion dollars, and this probably doesn't even include what the government uh, over there does. Uh, government is a huge, huge uh, insurer. One out of ten US Fortune 500 companies is an insurance company, and even in India right now, with a penetration level, India has a penetration level of I think 3.67 percent of the GDP is what the IRDA claims. Compare it to Taiwan, which has 20 percent, and uh, US, which has around 8 percent of the GDP, which goes into insurance. Uh, even even our friends in China are, are, are at four percent or something. So even with that sort of penetration, and that's when a lot of this insurance uh, in India are actually wealth products. You will see in most of the mass India sub jeevan bima karwate, and they don't buy insurance as insurance, but they buy insurance as wealth product. So there is a huge huge scope for insurance uh, working out in India, and it's even more interesting and exciting because even after being a five trillion dollar industry globally in insurance is just set ripe for disruption why is this happening one is the low level of penetration we talked about right if you think about mobile penetration geo is now in every hand but we haven't been able to get insurance in every hand we haven't been even after ayushman bharat and everything i don't think much of india is covered under, under health insurance forget about life insurance Customer expectation and risk profiles are changing. If you look at this picture, people, when we were talking about Lloyds, were moving around in carts. We were with till very, very recently, probably five years ago, and probably still now in 90% of the times we are moving around in car. And then most of the times now, at least in this user group that we are talking about, a lot of these folks, a lot of us will be moving around in Uber. Now the risk profile completely changes. If you are driving in your car, you are the driver. If you are driving under an Uber, the driver is driving, then who do you write underwrite and how do you underwrite? It's basic fundamental because the risk of who is driving, whether it's your driving skills that should be underwritten, whether the car that somebody else is driving or somebody else is breaking in. So everything changes on the data point itself. Apart from that, entirely new distribution methods are getting uh, you know possible with technology. So if you think about pineapple, Pineapple is a very, very interesting case of uh, insurance. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, one of, becoming one of the largest insure tech in uh, South Africa. What it does is it does a peer-to-peer -peer insurance and it does a peer-to-peer -peer insurance in a snap. So for example, what will happen is that you want to insure, let's say, your laptop. It's not that the insurance is ready and there is a ready-made product from one insurance company. You can just take snap of your, uh, snap being the picture of your laptop from different angles send it to pineapple what pineapple will do is put you into a group of people who own the laptop similar sort of laptop or want laptop insurance now this group collectively will take the risk on their head so tomorrow if something happens to your laptop it goes bad then this pool of people from what they have contributed like a small amount like let's say for example five dollars every month from that pool the claim will be taken or taken care of so this just fundamentally changes the way insurance works in how you can underwrite in a peer-to-peer -peer insurance. It's almost saying that, you know, uh, we are a group of pet, pet lovers. We all love our dogs, but none of the insurance company, they want to have an insurance for dogs. But for, my, for me, the dog is 
like my family member. So I want to take a healthcare insurance for my dog. I take the photo of the dog and put it up and there is a club of dog lovers who understand the pain. And they are saying that I'm forming a community of dog lovers and I'm, I'm going to just put $5 each for this. So tomorrow, if something happens to your dog, the community takes, the village takes care of the child. So that's how this insurance works. And, and, and it fundamentally changes the way this would not have been possible if there was no internet. This would not have been possible if there was no mobile phone which could take photograph at a high resolution, uh, could authenticate the geotagging where the dog is and all that sort of a thing is working together. So that's what I mean, mean by even after being a $5 trillion company and as we talked earlier, there being real dinosaurs sitting for very long, not having been disrupted. This is an industry which is which is very, very ripe for disruption. So that's that's the gold mix, right? Where if you already have a very large market where the use case is set, but you can still disrupt it. So that, that's where the lot of excitement is coming to in short time. So now let's just deep dive into what are the areas. And, and since this is going to be a hackathon, a bit of the technical sides of it also. Uh, and and uh, dividing insurance into those three or four parts that we talked about how insurance works. What are the areas in which disruption is happening and what sort of disruptions are we seeing? And what I I thought I thought a lot about it. Should I make it technical or, or should I make it more examples? So I have tended towards the examples. And if we deep, need to deep dive onto how the tech tech works over there, we can talk later or even I can take in questions or one of the mentor sessions. I'm happy to answer over there. So the first first part is the underwriting part, right? Like underwriting, as we talked about, is how you price a risk and the science behind it. It's pure, pure prob stats. You put a probability to a particular uh, incidents happening. Based on the probability, you know how much pool you have. So you know the expected outcome and you say, that's why I'm going to take this much price from you. Or even that's why I am either going to write a particular product or not going to write a particular product. So each different kind of uh, insurance have their own different type of underwriting models. But what is happening nowadays is why it is this is and how it is getting disrupted. If you look at it, entirely new data set have come. So these are the few examples I have get, uh, put over here. Like uh, if I were in a uh, physical conference, I would have asked for a hand of uh, like show of hand and see how many of you are in CureFit or how many of you are on Healthify Me. How of you? Facebook account, I'm just taking for granted everybody has. But if you think about it, uh, you generally uh, generate now many more data footprints and which, 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 which tells us or the insurance company something about you. For example, if you take Ola and you have a car, I would be very, very willing to underwrite your car at a much lower price. I would be probably willing to take underwrite your car at uh, a fraction or not even checking that way. If I can see a pattern that every day to office you are going by Ola everywhere you are taking. So maybe only on weekend you drive your car. Your car is going to be sitting around. There is very less probability of an accident happening for that car. So that tells me so much more about vehicle underwriting that uh, I can predict and I can just price that it changes everything. The last three corners that you have, CureFit, Healthify, Me, Apple Watch, they can tell me so much more about your health, which otherwise a health test or other things would not have told me. Those, those are proactive data points. Similarly, AI and ML driven uh, byte personalized underwriting. What's happening is like if you look at Trub, what it does is uh, earlier for underwriting, how would an underwriting happen? Even if you go 10 years back, you will send a bunch of data written on paper to an underwriting old statistician sitting in the insurance company who will take his calculator out, take his uh, Excel sheet out, try to write uh, prop stats on that and try to take out his charts and try to give you a price. That's why you see how does any property and casualty insurance, this entire quotation system, you will hear from your agent and the brokers a lot that I will share the quotation with you. That quotation used to happen. But now think about Trav now, because of what has happened is that so much of data, so much processing power, you can, Trav is an insurance where you can just go and say that, hey, I'm going for a ski trip for the next five years, uh, next five days. This ski trip, uh, this ski, ski trip is going to be in this slope, in this mountain, and I have done these many ski trips. Here is my travel history and here is proof. 
all digital proof because you would have some travel history or something which can be pulled. And Krav instantaneously will run its ML models over there where it is known. And it's finally what? It's just prop stats, right? It's, it, it has known that in that slope, so many accidents have happened. This is the sort of uh, you know professional level of this guy. So this is the probability of him going to this particular slope and thus this accident happening. And it will instantaneously within the next five minutes probably send you a quotation that for this trip, if you pay $5, you are OK. We can give you an insurance that if anything happens to you during that skiing trip, you are covered. And this is only for these five days. This bite size insurance, and this is just one example. There can be multiple other examples. This bite size insurance uh, examples, like they did not used to exist. And without AI ML, they would not exist. Similarly, another insurance uh, use case, parametric insurance, which, by the way, I am the most bullish on. So if anybody of you decide to take up parametric insurance and try to solve for it, please do come to me. I would love to talk about it. Uh, what happens in parametric insurance? I'll give you an example of Philippines uh, where I was working and you guys should check out this company called Card uh, Pioneer, which is a, a large micro insurance and micro tech uh, micro uh, finance company. What parametric insurance tells tells you about you if, uh, uh, tells you is that, hey, if you are th if you have a third party data set which can confirm that the incidents happen. So think about it, like what happens in live insurance, that if something happens to you, you have to say, let's say a person X has a life insurance, he dies, he has to go to the insurance, his beneficiary has to go to the insurance company and tell that X died, here is the proof, now you give me an insurance claim. And this claim process generally can take from anywhere to four months to six months, in many cases, years. And then that's the experience that gets broken. These sort of things are very, very challenging in, let's say, crop insurance and other places where you have to set, send somebody to that field. So think about that. You as an insurance agent, you are going to Uttar Pradesh, some field where you know that the villagers can just grab you and, and you have to say that whether you are going to say yes or no on the claim. So the entire process, the entire field over there breaks out. So that's where parametric insurance comes in place. Let's say you have third party data sets which is like satellite imagery or with something like that. So what you say is that the insurance is not going to vary. So in claims, think about in claims, there are two part of the answers. One answer is yes and no, whether the insurance will be given or not. The second part is the size of the loss, right? Whether the, for example, if you have been ever been in a car accident or you have been in a bike accident, there are two things to be certain over there, whether the accident happened or not, but if the accident happened, what was the size of the loss? What parametric insurance does, it, it, it says that whatever, irrespective of the accident size, I just need to determine with the accident, accident happened or not. And if the answer is yes, there is a fixed amount which I will just send it to you. So think about it. If flood comes in Bihar, as a third party, nobody needs to come to me and tell me, hey, these are the areas where flood happened because satellite imagery is already telling that. So nobody needs to come and tell me that, hey, I had an insurance from you. There is a flood. Now give me my loss is 1,500 rupees. You need to pass me 1,500 rupees. What I do is that the first data set that whether I ha you have an insurance from me or not, I have it. What is your PIN code? I have it. From a third party data set, I know that flood happened. If I just set it that the, whether the loss is 1,500 or 1,200, and just say that the policy is such that you'll get 1000 rupees irrespective of whatever your loss is. You can, without him also claiming, you can just send or push through that 1000 rupees to the claimant. And in that case, the claim experience becomes so much better that think about it. If the accident happened, you don't need to go and tell the insurance company, hey, give me money, but the money directly comes to your pocket. And that's where parametric insurance in terms of, uh, so this card pioneer, they worked on uh, typhoon and cyclone insurance because that was very frequent in Philippines. The use case grew a lot. There is a lot of discussion around crop insurance and I believe India crop insurance solution around parametric insurance or even cyclone and flood insurance. They are use cases right to be, uh, to be catered to. So a lot to be done on parametric insurance for sure. IoT and hardware just, uh, running through fast because I know I have a lot of slides to cover and I'm going deep into one. But IoT and hardware is uh, something where, you know, like uh, uh, you will see the variables or you will see the OD, OB2 port devices where 
if you put it in the car you will know how many miles the car is driving so insurance think about it logically if the car is driving more the risk of it having an accident is more so it should be correlated to that sort of a driving behavior rather than just fix saying that hey this car is this this much old and that's why how this much should be the insurance so that's where this iot and other devices are working which are going towards usage and other risk based insurances that's more on the underwriting part but if you look at the distribution part so insurance finally after being rendered written has to be sold and that's where the insurance companies make money so one part which is getting disrupted left right and center is end to end digital experience so if you look about it our dads or our parents the way they would take insurance is fill up the form send it to an agent agent will bring it but if you look at lemonade which by the way did ipo very recently uh, it listed at a price of 28 dollars and went to 120 dollars in like 3 hours or something uh they make it an entirely online and digital experience you just need to take the photograph of your house upload it and that get insurance you get an insurance right away right out it's uh, because this is much relevant to right now the time now discovery along with inmobi on the glance uh, that the front screen that you get they created a covid insurance for which you need not go to any doctor or anything just with your front of your uh, mobile phone you could get a covid insurance right away so that end to end digital experience is much telling because you know in the times of such pandemic where are you going to go for medical tests are you going to go to a hospital to take a medical test to buy an insurance now you won't be doing that so similarly a lot of this end to end digital experience will matter uh, interestingly one interesting point in march when lockdown was announced the insurance uh, premium which are generally the largest selling happens in march and april because that's the tax month they fell down drastically because people realize till now almost 85% of india uh, the premium collection is offline and agents could not in lockdown go out and collect the premium but the companies which were digitized more which were able to collect through digital channels their premiums number of premium actually was relatively less hit and and that's where the insurance companies also realize that you know like uh, there is a the power of digitization and they are going to go more and more full digital experience group selling is another one where you will see like uh, multiple group ola is trying to sell insurance uh, grab is trying to sell insurance next insurance is a very very interesting use case in us which you guys should see it makes insurance by profession so think you are a yoga teacher you have a group of yoga teacher the nature of yoga teacher is uh, is a such that you can predict behavior of those in a group in a much better way and in that case you can underwrite for them in, with much less data point than uh, you know like uh, needing for broader data points so entirely new channel and crowdfunding is similar to the pineapple insurance that we talked about so i'm going to rush through a little this a little bit similarly in claims management we already talked about uh, smart contracts which was the parametric insurance similar to that smart contracts are you will see in blockchain the smart contracts work work on third party data sources so think about it that most of you would have bought a travel insurance but hardly anybody of us any one of us would have ever made a claim to it so what digit is doing is that if a flight gets delayed it's very easy for them to know that the flight has been delayed right they do not need to uh, know it from you so they are directly sending the money out to phone pay wallet or any uh, wallet from which you have done the purchase so that's that's sort of a smart contract like the smart contract the way it works is that uh, there is a trigger which is defined in the contract and that trigger is based on some third party data and as as soon as the third party data says that the trigger has been uh, uh, like put in so that that contract gets uh, gets executed so that's the smart contract usage uh, claim settlement a lot of use on computer vision is going so for example if uh, a car accident happens generally a Uh, a surveyor goes and he sort of surveys the car and tries to say that uh, you know like uh, the accident has really happened or not uh, you can do all of that using just move your mobile phone and that's what's happening in china you will just take a few snaps you will take the few photographs and you'll realize that uh, you know the car has gone through an accident and the claim can be processed and when such large amount of claims are in place you can understand that there will be a lot of fraud as well so fraud analytics companies like daisy and all they they put in uh, again uh, artificial intelligence to find out if there is a fraud fraud in the claim or not 
so for example a story was uh, uh, there was a story around uh, in haryana this happened was that a lot suddenly uh, one of the insurance companies was seeing that there was a lot of claims around life insurance which they had not seen earlier and then they slowly realized that it was coming from one district and actually one doctor was always involved with it and what was happening was that there was this gang who will go to and this is very morbid who will go to this critically ill patient like people who are on cancer and they know that they are going to die in some time they will take up life insurances and there will be a particular group of doctor who will say that no they do not have any uh, you know like any illness or something and they will be getting able to get an insurance and after when they die they will like try to show that it was an accident and they died and they will get the insurance claim the family will get the insurance claim and this gang will get a cut out of it so this is the sort of fraud which happens but when if you can geo tag from where it is coming if you can do a uh, big data analysis on is there particular doctors from which it is coming or you can do correlation for example daisy does it on dental insurance that if you have a dental emergency when you had gone another expense was on you know dental cleaning they generally don't happen together so they just try to minimize on those uh, uh, those fraud cases by using fraud analytics over there and lastly a lot of action is happening on the tech infrastructure layer similar to what you are seeing in the banking infrastructure layer uh, api layers are getting created where postman comes is actually uh, you will see multiple of this company even in india say to automatic discovery they are trying to integrate with all the insurance companies whose it infrastructure is archaic and it's it's a it's a big pain to actually just uh, work with them so what they are saying is that we will create a api layer on top of you we will do all the plumbing with you now any fintech or insurtech who wants to work on insurance can just come to us and work we will give the api documentation and you can just start working directly with us you do not have to go through that integration pain with all this uh, different uh, insurance company one by one so that's that's more around the api layer i think uh, vfox is one company you guys should check out uh, how they are creating the api layer any company which is able to successfully do the api layering with the insurance companies will be sitting on a gold mine and lot of action will happen from there so those were some of the areas on which you could see uh, what globally innovations is ha innovations are happening if you were to broadly look at it insurance is primarily nothing but flow of information data comes from the customer it's used by prop uh, prop stats models and based on those those modeling people write a risk and say that hey this is the price it's a pricing exercise per se so that's where you will see mostly in an insurance company there are probably eight areas in which data is uh, used uh, i have decided divided them into accessibility and success accessibility means that if you are not able to do that like if you are not able to do risk assessment or price modeling then you cannot cannot write the insurance at all and success is probably what if you can do better then you have better chances of selling the insurance but which is comes the distribution angle so for example if you are segment able to segment the customer or if you come to this life event marketing again exactly what if you go back to my own example my customer persona this is what you will see a lot if there was a way i could know that this person is getting married now or this person is having a child now let's say ola for example has a big data they know that you are uh, have suddenly started making trip to a maternity hospital quite a few, bit of time it knows that you are going to have a child so it knows that probably this is the right right moment quite an apt moment when it should the insurance company should pitch for a life insurance to you similarly if you are doing a pricing and similar again ola uber example if i know that you go to the gym or if i know that if you are going to let's say a hospital i know that there is something either wrong or either you have a good behavior so i can go and price you accordingly similar things in personalized marketing as well if you think about if i have to do a personalized marketing to you you have taken again the example of ola if you are taken or make my trip is a better example let's say in make my trip you are booking a flight you know that that's the time when uh, uh, this thing should be pitched to you uh, 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 travel insurance should be pitched to you but take it to the next level you know that you have the ticket that you have bought is you have bought, bought it as a refundable ticket or you have bought a ticket which is 
probably two months down the line. It's it's a uh, too far away. If you can do a prediction over here, you can sort of predict that most of this customer also fear that tomorrow they might end up canceling their plan. Their plan is not very firm. Closer to, to the trip you are, more firmer the plan you have. So now what Make My Trip and the Clear Trips of the World can do over here is offer a visa cancellation or cancellation sort of a insurance to you that, okay, if the flight you end up canceling, here is a sort of a punt I can take over there. There are other things which are coming up. Train cancellation is coming. So you know the waiting list of the train. You can predict by that that how many, how much of the waiting list will get, you know, finally converted into a confirmed ticket in a particular route or how much of RSE tickets will get confirmed into a confirmed ticket in a particular route. So this also you can underwrite. So all this data and the information, if you can get a capture on, there is new products that you can write and there is better pricing and better marketing that you can do. And that's where most of this information is. So now trying to bring it closer to what the topic that we have is account aggregator, what's happening now. With account aggregator, you get for the first time a access to the data, which most of the time is this financial services companies, the insurance companies or the wealth companies would not have never have shared with you otherwise. So if I'm an insurance company, I would not, I would have had to rely on you or ask you for policy document to know if you have had multiple policies. But right now with account aggregator, I can just ask you for the consent and I will know how many policies you have. Now you may ask that what is this information around how many policies I have, but how many policies you have can give a lot of behavior around what you are trying to do. Let's say you have two health policies already and you are trying to build buy another health policy. There could be something wrong. I will just raise the risk level over there because you know, like uh, it, it shows indicates a tendency that you want to cover for certain risk over there. Now you might not be, but my risk appetite with you will be going a little lower that uh, why are you ready to shelf out more money over there? Similarly, what you can do is uh, what a lot of this wealth management or personal finance management companies are trying to do is it will take your profile. It will look for what sort of policies you have. Now, again, go back to me as a customer persona. Now, when I move to this life phase where I am a, more a family man than just a, let's say a college student, an ideal family man should have this, this, this risk covered. That's the benchmark over there. Now I might have missed something. So for example, I have a property. I have not taken a property insurance tomorrow. That property uh, is probably 20, 30% of my saving tomorrow. Let's say a fire happens an earthquake happens, that property goes for a toss. All that of my insurance will be gone or assume I have a home loan and I have not taken a home loan insurance. If I die, my family will have to sort of probably at least to claim that property will have to give that home loan insurance. Uh, they will have to pay back the home loan. If they, I had taken a credit risk insurance, I would not have had to pay it back. The family would not have had to pay it back. So all I'm saying is you can do a much better job of recommending what sort of insurance this guy needs, what of coverage they have by looking at their account aggregator sort of information what sort of policies they already have, what sort of policy you don't have. Similarly, you can always do a price benchmarking. One of the reasons why doing this account aggregator is so important and also going to be so difficult is if you think about a bank or if you think about any of the financial services companies, the gold mine they have, the more they have is the data. They never want to share this data with anyone, right? And uh, because what does bank do? If HDFC has a salary account with you, they will know what sort of uh, uh, purchases you have done, what you have, what you don't have, and they will cross sell. But suddenly now, if you have your policy, I know what price you have given for that policy. I can standardize the policy. I can sell you if I can tell you if I am ready to take a lower bet on you and the consumer is the king, then suddenly you can lower the price of the policy or benchmark or standardize the price and then just give it. I'm not even going into a lot of the other things that you can do with such financial statements if readily available in a standardized format, because then you can write all your queries and all your uh, analysis on top of it. Right now you get it in bank statement form, stamped and hard code, and then, then you use perfumes of the world. But if you get it in standardized format, so for one example is again spend analysis. If I can look at you, I can do your spend analysis. I can know you inside out. Right? I can know you, this is a person who goes to gym. This is a person 
who goes to uh, yoga classes or rather let's take the native case this is a person who doesn't go to gym doesn't go to anywhere he goes out drinking he goes out partying every night he is the one who also goes out travels a lot this is me in the middle phase when if you look at it like i am taking a lot of adventure trips i am taking a lot of travel i am taking a lot of risks in my life would i be willing to would i be pricing myself low or high on a life policy if i write for this guy i will generally price my life policy for this person much higher at a much costlier way than if i were to write a life policy for somebody who is going to gym regularly has a very boring sedentary life is doesn't take much risk comes back to home and that sort of a person right so as if i were that person i would generally want to be written much different way than a person who is right uh, living uh, living another lifestyle so all this personalized reco all this sort of things they are very very uh, very very important data points while underwriting an insurance to people similarly around the claim side right if you are making a claim it's very very uh, it becomes very very easy if i have your financial proven financial data points to uh, find out whether this claim is genuine or not so for example if you get hospitalized you might have surely bought some you know medicines something before that if you have not bought any medicines i can ask for a double check or similarly if you have been you know like uh, your uh, spend shows that you have been in some other place geographically and you are suddenly making a claim that no you were in money so for example your spend shows that you were actually in uh, spending some amount of money somewhere in indranagar just a few days back and you are claiming that you are hospitalized in let's say whitefield manipal i can easily said say that so all sort of that data points can happen on a uh, you know account aggregator and financial uh, data beyond just what we talk about or what we normally think about but that that's the sort of models which the insurance companies generally come up with i i have just kept a few examples i think i we talked about a bit of that price benchmarking we talked about fraud detection we talked about reco engine we talked about that uh, what is the how the records should be so i'm going to skip this one the other use case which is going to be very very powerful and unique and i think both of them fall under samati uh, and i spirit spirit and i would like to thank you guys for that is the national health stack because if you think about it and and my prediction by the way if you look at indian insurance uh, industry right now uh, around 75% of it is life insurance and 25% of it is general insurance of general insurance also 50% is uh, vehicle health is probably only 10 15% of the overall insurance premiums which are written in india whereas india as a young demography and increasingly now trying to grow old they will need a lot more health cover and this is not possible without you have proper you know like like right now a lot of uh, challenges goes into you will have to take a medical test you will have to go a lot of inertia goes around there and underwriting is not possible and health insurance doesn't go come that easily uh very interestingly during covid for the first time uh, uh irda pushed by the pandemic has approved for teleconsultation a uh, premium payment being made out uh, sorry the claims payment being made out to teleconsultation as well as uh, you know like uh, teleconsultation as a mode of giving health check up before underwriting an insurance as well so lot of thing happening over there but i think india health stack where you have jam and the india stack below which facilitates premium payment in very small smaller bites irda has also in the recent regulation allowed for monthly payment of health insurance which is a very 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 big step uh, if you think about it the poor people until, uh, or the or, or, or not so well to do peer social segment they cannot pay insurance like you or me in like in one go they cannot pay 25000 rupees or 20000 rupees they for them the cash flow is every month so can you map it to the monthly pay cycle or the cash flow that comes to them can you make insurance non binary that you pay once that money and then you have insurance for the entire year can you make it do that okay this month you are paying 10 rupees you have a cover of 500 rupees next month if you pay 20 rupees you have a cover of 1000 rupees feel free to pay it in a nac with sort of a way enac is just getting deducted and you are paying on the go so those sort of facilitation will come from india stack but more importantly from the health stack you will have an access to the health history of the person you will know what sort of uh, medication he has been under has he been prone to some has been has there been some pre existing diseases 
So this financial data and health record together are such a powerful 360 degree view of the customer profile that I believe that underwriting should be a ziffy after that. And, and if you are thinking about building something on InsurTech, this is another area I will uh, encourage you a lot to look deeper into how the account aggregator and the national health stack together can create a health insurance uh, where underwriting can be done within two minutes. Like uh, you do not have to wait uh, for all this processes which currently happens in uh, health insurance underwriting. So net net, what will be the impact of account aggregator or insure tech ecosystem? You know, prices as we talked about will get standardized and lower. Generally, the cost of insurance should go down. Uh, if you think about it, uh, there will be more personalization. So of course, if you are a risky customer, it can go up for you. But net net, if uh, there are insurance companies which are making arbitrage, other insurances com insurance companies will come in and compete and uh, uh, beat them on price. Finally, also an innovation and proliferation of newer products. We believe that there is a lot of new products which can create around with along the lines of account aggregator. Not going too deep into it because I think some of the examples I shared can obviously get benefited a lot from the data we will get from uh, a uh, stack. But uh, one critical example will be this parametric credit insurance. If you think about it right now, and I, I was talking to Ariman. He was telling me that one of the uh, college team actually has a plan around it. I, it. It's a lovely plan because what you'll see, what right now happens is most of this, uh, most of the small businesses, uh, when they sell something, their account receivable generally takes around uh, 120 days, 90 days for them for that money to come back. Now, on one side, it is a lending problem which is being solved by invoice discounting, uh, where you get working capital, but then you pay around anywhere from 10 to 20 percent. Uh, of that money uh, in interest uh, uh, to the NBFCs uh, to get that capital, but a lot of this, a uh, lot of these companies, they do not. They are happy to wait out the 90 days. What they are more worried about is the counterparty risk, where the person says after 90 days that I'm not going to pay you this money. So that they can get insured now, if they have a lot of this uh, history on these people, and an insurance company can, uh, you know, like get access. If you look at in threads, there is a threads platform uh, where a lot of these companies are currently struggling to get this data. The insurance company at least are struggling to get this data from uh, people whom these invoices or the bills have been written to. But tomorrow with account aggregator, if you can just give a consent and the other party has to give you this and you can show your transaction history and everything in one go, then insurance companies can underwrite this credit uh, or trade uh, risk, trade insurance. And it will come at around two or three percent of the invoice uh, value instead of giving you know ten to twenty percent in the uh, in the credit uh, uh, in the invoice credit that you will otherwise take. And lastly, all this will be very ripe, and and you guys must surely look into all these examples. I will not go deeper into all these examples. Happy to share this deck, and you guys can have a look at it. Uh, a lot is happening at IRDA's sandbox. So for the first time. Insurance is a highly, highly regulated industry. And this is my last slide. Uh, so insurance is a very, very highly regulated industry. What happens here is that uh, IRDA will not easily allow you to do whatever you want to do because you are taking money from a lot of people. And tomorrow, if you don't re return that money, the faith from that entire industry goes away. So that's why government regulates it a lot. And that's where the new technology or disrupting this industry has been difficult. But what IRDA has said is that I'm going to launch a sandbox where you don't do it for uh, the entire mass population at one go. There will be a hard cap of around 10,000 customers. And there is like a hard cap of around $70,000 gross written premium. But you can experiment on that. And if I like your experiment tomorrow, I'll let you do it at a mass scale. So it's almost like you dip your feet, for, feet first. As a regulator, give me confidence. And then I'll let you do there is such a huge interest from the insurance companies now to partner with tech companies and do these experiments. It's not even funny. Like Goki, for example, when it was doing its wearable healthcare, uh, health, like wearable based healthcare insurance, where it's uh, if you wear a Goki band, the data it puts can de decide what sort of premium you are paying. Uh, there were four insurance companies which were ready to work and went with four insurance company into the sandbox, did it its experience experiment and it now has become the go-to wearable uh, device for all the insurance companies 
So I will encourage a lot if you are thinking about making something on the insure tech side uh, to work on the sandboxes. Uh, approach the insurance companies for sandboxes. Give your idea and try to run some examples on the sandboxes and then see if something works. Then that could be the next big idea on insure tech. So that's that's something unique that is happening in India and uh, not many regulators are doing that. Uh, but a great opportunity, I would say. So I know this has been a long unilateral discussion. I'm happy to take questions. Uh, and uh, obviously, that, that's my Twitter account. Feel free to follow. I reply to all DMs. Uh, I have shared my email as well. If you have any questions about insurance, FinTech, life in general, funding, technology, more than happy to answer. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, really interesting stuff. I think you 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 know you went into detail about on a few topics, and still there's so much more to cover. So uh, teams who are interested in this, please be aware that Anand is a mentor. So he is you know agreed to give some of his time. So if you'd like to reach out to him, as he said, for advice on insurance, fintech, business model, fundraising, life in general, please do reach out. Um, the sandbox in particular seemed like a really interesting idea. And I think hopefully, you know, our hope in the hackathon is that we just innovation comes out of it. So you mentioned the health stack and, you know, everybody here should be aware that a lot of work is happening on health stack as well. So uh, all of that information can be found on iSpirit's blog. Um, so you just Google iSpirit National Health Stack NHS, you'll probably find some articles. Um, and we'll probably have a hackathon on the health stack as well in the future. But for the account aggregator, the IRDA sandbox seems like a great place to actually uh, experiment with business models around insurance and account aggregators. So uh, the trade credit one, you know, in particular seems quite good. So uh, thanks for that. That's awesome. Uh, should we do some questions? We have some questions from the audience. How do you want to go about it? Like, uh, should we take from the top or? Yeah, we'll just take the top one, the most upvoted ones first. Okay, I think that most uh, the top one is most upvoted as well, probably. Uh, the question is for P2P insurance, is the community pool large enough to cover a standard claim? That's a, that's a very, very good co co uh, question. The community pool has to be large enough for this to take place. So I'll take the example of Saibao, which is the biggest such uh, P2P insurance in the world. It's in uh, China. It works on WeChat. What it does, it works on three phases, and I uh, didn't touch upon in much nitty gritty. Happy to answer it in mentor uh, session as well. The first phase is what works as a uh, what works as a what you call is a, let's say the community driver. So it will first try to create a community. So only it will open up. So for the pet example, only those communities will open up which which like where you can seed the community and form the community first. And then those communities grow. So there is a chicken and egg problem for sure over there. But that's just like any other marketplace. For example, for Shaiba, what they do is that they work only on health insurance in a P2P model, in a community model. They will do is that like Milap or Keto, you will see a lot of this uh, 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 projects running over there where they will ask for small donations, micro donations. And people who give micro donation, then they will try to bring on to this community where they want to get into a P2P insurance uh, place. And there, they do not charge any premium, but these people pool. And if anything, if the pool is not used, all this money goes back to people who were there in the pool. But if a claim happened, then the money is taken from the pool to serve the claim. And the insurance company gets the money out of claim processing. But here, there is this phase. So uh, for example, in Shaibao, the first level creating the community, they have like 109 million folks. Of that, 30 million folks have gone, in, gone into creating a P2P insurance. And of that, probably 1 million or somebody have gone got into uh, uh, getting claims till now. So that's where it, it works through certain seeding. If it is more exotic like pineapple, you have to seed and if you have to choose the community and let the community grow. Uh, obviously, in a very small pool, it's, it's without P2P also. If you had to have a health insurance for two people, the health insurance will not work. And that's where when any insurance, whether it be P2P or not, if you launch a new InsurTech product, the first thing the insurance company asks for is the guarantee of a minimum pool. Uh, so for example, in onshority, when we are working, they will ask for a, it's a health insurance. Uh, the underwriter will always ask for a minimum pool before we start it. That, that will always remain a, uh, my, my bottom line answer is that you'll have to find out a pay, way to create the minimum pool. Without that, insurance as a concept itself doesn't work. 
Oh, that was the question number one with five upvotes. I'm trying to see what sort of upvotes we have. Uh, there is another question with three upvotes. Uh, I'm not sure most of the example mentioned here take into account that consent of the data is under the control of person being pitched or insured. Why would anyone give consent to sharing data which increases their premium? Uh, because without that, I will not give you an insurance. So it's, a, it's a, as simple as that. Like today, if you say, for example, in absence of this data, what you have to give me is a medical test. If you go and tell an insurance that, hey, I don't want to give you a medical test, give me insurance, they'll say, I won't give you. Uh, same thing will happen with account aggregator uh, consent that, or, or what will happen is that if you give me account aggregator consent, I will personalize the price and give you. Otherwise, I have a blanket default, very high price, which is the, for the riskiest bucket. And you don't give me the consent and you fall in that riskiest bucket and you just are a price taker then. The, I, I hope I answered that. Otherwise, happy to have to engage in that. Uh, then what? In the context of using a, I think I'm just crossing one hour. Ariman, let me know if I need to stop. Otherwise, I'll take this one more question. Uh, in the context of using a, Sorry, Ayman. No, no, I was just going to say we're good. I think, you know, some great questions. And so please, uh, you know, let's keep taking questions. In the context of using a person's data for pitching insurance along with account aggregators, won't only people with good habits will give consent for data about these activities? I think broadly I answered it with this, the last question. You will have to give it. May I know a bit about insurance self network platform license to sell insurance if I am an API infrastructure company uh, self network. What do you mean by self network platform license? Uh, I did not understand it. Do you mean by that? Can you sell insurance yourself or not? If that is the question, then there are uh, corporate. There are two sort of licenses there, either corporate agent license or broking license. Uh, and you have to apply to the IRDA to at least take one license before being able to sell. Otherwise, you cannot directly sell uh, uh, insurance without having any of these licenses. Or you can go and enroll with one of the corporate agents and all. And in that case, there is a field agent license where you have to do a two-day uh, course and give a give a test to become an agent, insurance agent at least. OK. Uh, I have heard that group health insurance is lower cost and higher claim ratio. Is that accurate? And if so, why does the insurance insurer work in this segment? Uh, yes, group health insurance is uh, uh, sometimes I will say not profitable for the insurer and it's a higher claim ratio. Uh, generally, the insurer works for the LTV. They think that the claims ratio will not be high and that's why that's one of the reasons. But the second more reason is around the float as well, that if you are, can have a long term relationship with that uh, customer base, and as I said, 90% of the money comes from float. If you can add to your float, uh, then that, that helps you earn money from that, that account. The third one, which is the most important one, is the cross-selling one. If you are, uh, uh, you know, like uh, in a pool, and if you are, let's say, if you are in a, uh, most of these insurances, which will be coming as employee insurance to you, there will be an insurance component to it where you can add your uh, parents or you can add your a uh, spouse or sister or somebody and that attach rate goes to the uh, to generally the uh, at a higher attach rate sort of a thing uh, to the insurer and they make money out of it uh, so that that's the sort of things that they do but otherwise th this has still been this has still been a debated thing in india that, uh, that there is a lot of challenges around that uh, group healthcare policy policy what goes in the case of lapses? Does that money is quick gain for insurance company? Uh, yes. Yeah. Generally, if uh, if you lapse, if you don't don't uh, you know like that that premium, there are certain conditions in which they have to return and all. That's all. So that's where another problem of insurance lies is the fine prints which goes into the policy. But if you lapse and don't pay the premium, that premium, uh, the previous premium mostly sits in insurances uh, company. But you should come out of the you should look at the exclusions page for sure. Good presentation. Thank you, Chanam SK. Thoughts on data protection laws and concern on data sharing issues dysfunction. This is a big issue. Uh, of course, insurance, that's one of the reasons why insurance companies are very, uh, or financial services company in general are very, very, uh, uh, you know, regulated as well as 
they move slow uh, because data protection is, uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a very, very, very big concern. Uh, especially uh, if you are working with health data in uh, US and all HIPAA guidelines are there and the other guidelines are here. In India also, the government is very, very strict uh, with the laws on data process, product and data sharing issues. Uh, I don't get the exact uh, question, like thoughts on data protection law. If the question is with if, if with account aggregator that will get threatened, my personal belief is that the power of my data should be with, with me. If I want to uh, you know, share that data with some organization which is giving me uh, better access, I should just have the pipes, which is what account aggregator is, to share that data more efficiently. And uh, that that's good enough. That's good for me. So I think that that works. And, uh, in life insurance, premium is regulated and cannot be made tailor-made. How can account aggregator help this even insured share the policy? Insurance premiums are uh, you know like insurance premiums are uh, regulated not in a way that uh, it has to be exactly this. That's where they move in a particular range. When an insurance company files the insurance uh, uh, particular scheme, so you will see in IRDA, there is a host of the list of these products are filed. There are different, different products. So even like life insurance company, when they come, they have 50 different products. They file for a range of uh, range of prices and they say that if the risk is this, I'll give this price and this, this all. That's how they work. So they can vary the prices they work, and especially with the sandboxes and others where you are seeing that, you know, like uh, even pay per use insurance when it is coming up, uh, this, this I think will not remain a challenge. It's not going to be like, hey, this is the only price that you can give. This will be a range of price in which it will vary. They will not, the regulator will not let you, what regulator does is periodically on that product, they keep checking the claims ratio. If, for example, you have priced a product at 100 rupees, but the claims is coming only 20 and you are making 80 rupees of profit, then the regulator will come down very heavily on you. They will generally make you price a particular pool in a certain way that your claims ratios are at least 60% and above 70, 80% is what they generally want to do that. What is the Uber Ola cult's incentive to share their data with insurance company? Good question. Uh, the simple answer is to make money. Uh, for example, Ola will share the data and sh sell uh, sell insurance through their own platform. You can already see that Ola Financial Services is there. Cult has uh, is uh, I think doing already a brokering of uh, insurance company. So that's where their deep tie up. The data will be monetized over there for sure. Uh, some will monetize by passing on the data to a third party. Some will monetize by selling their own insurance. For example, in Ola, if you sit, you already do a personal accident insurance, right? And Ola makes roughly like six, seven crores a month from that. So it's it's a large amount of money because if you think about it for insurance, you don't need to do anything but just pass data. Unlike e-commerce where you have to sell logistics or do logistics, there is nothing like that over there. So I'll probably take another last question before I end the session because I think Aryaman and I both have to go back to our weekends as well. And all of you as well, you guys have been a great uh, audience. I'll take, uh, okay, there are only two left, so I'll go with these two only. If the user did not give consent for certain info, but third party data sets indicate risk about the user collected independently, what are the regulations around denials? How does this play along with newer inclusivity efforts? So uh, you will have to showcase uh, uh, that you are using this third party data and you can deny insurance in that case. It's, it's a very case to case basis. But you can definitely, there is nothing, insurance is a private company. You can be denied insurance. It's not that you cannot be denied insurance. So uh, it's finally somebody is underwriting that risk. So third party data sets very regularly are used for indicating insurance and you can be denied insurance. So how are the regulations evolving around the premium claim spend ratios, particularly for the new models? And this is a very, very interesting question and very, very, uh, you know, a lot of regulatory thought is going into it. Basically, what is being asked is premium and claim spend ratio, because what happened was a lot of this travel insurances, for example, Jongan, uh, almost 85% of the insurance, if you are paying 100 rupees for a travel insurance, 85% of that just goes away to the, uh, to the 
travel agent that is to the make my trips of the world and only 15% goes for the insurance covered per se so it already assumed that the spend and the claim ratio will be just 10 15% and in a way the client uh, the client is being the customer is being looted over there for lack of any other word so uh, multiple self paced places uh, you know the agent uh, commission has been capped by the regulator for example in uh, for example vehicle insurance oems used to do that so the regulator has capped it at around 17% for the dealers uh, but that said still there are methods by which uh, all this channel partners or the distributors are taking money back and and this this uh, misaligned interest remains over there uh, the question if it is if the government is taking a very hard stance regulator is very very strong over here uh, but uh, but it will it will it will evolve it will evolve even more in case of the tech driven in short tech driven insurances so that's all i think thank you so much guys you guys have been great audience and uh, happy to take any question on twitter or uh, mail as well thank you so much anand once again for you know giving this master class and all your support to the hackathon i think it was really useful for everybody so thank you very much and uh, everybody else we'll be back tomorrow so i'll leave the e meet open for some time in case you want to network and chat in the social lounge um but tomorrow we begin at 3 pm at 3 pm we have a talk on uh, account aggregator ui ux and consent journeys by dharmesh ba 4 pm we have a talk about lending with account aggregators by manish bhatia of lending cart 5 pm we have data science and ml ai by the co-founder of jovian.ml so see you guys tomorrow at 2:45 pm anand thank you very much once again thank uh, for your manner pleasure and you have been a great host okay great hosting this one here thank see, you see you guys bye bye